What is chronic wasting disease and what does it mean for those hunting white-tailed deer? Those questions and more coming up next. Hi, I'm the OCD Hunter bringing you tips, tricks, DIY hacks, and other useful ways that my OCD can make your life a little bit more simpler. I contacted the DNR and the CDC requesting an interview to get more educated on the topic of chronic wasting disease. And through several emails and phone calls, my search has brought me here. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Brett Marsh, the Indiana State Veterinarian representing the Indiana Department of Board of Animal Health. Brett, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, answer these questions for us. Thank you for the invitation. So let's start off with what's your position and just tell me a little bit more about it. I'm the Indiana State Veterinarian and I was appointed by the Board of Animal Health. There's an 11 person board that's appointed by the governor of Indiana and I'm appointed by that board with the approval of the governor. So I'm required to have at least five years of veterinary experience before taking on this role. And through an application and interview process, I was selected for the job. And what exactly is the Indiana Board of Animal Health, or known as BOA? Board of Animal Health, as the name suggests, is in the animal health business. And we've been in this business for over 130 years. So we do the administer the animal health programs across the state of Indiana and all, all species, livestock species in particular, but we also do the rabies control program and companion animals. And we collaborate with our Department of Natural Resources on issues in wild species. So it's a broad range of issues. In addition to animal health, we also do meat inspection, meat and poultry inspection and dairy inspection. So we have a food safety role and a lot of preparedness initiatives as well. So dealing with animal issues and disasters, whether they're floods, earthquakes, or a disease disaster. Tell me, do you know how BOA got started and why? Well, I think the citizens back in the late 1800s decided that there needed to be an entity to focus on animal health issues. And of course, the interface between animals and people is extremely important. So there are diseases in animals that people can get, uh, zoonotic diseases, so those were some of the important ones that started. Also important is making sure that you have disease-free animals for trade purposes. So you could move animals in interstate or international commerce. So the citizens at that time, and not only in Indiana, but across the country, established boards of animal health. They've changed and morphed over time, but uh, there was an entity to at least have responsibility for the animal health populations of the state and trying to improve their health situation for disease control and improvement for trade. So what is CWD or chronic wasting disease? Now, chronic wasting disease is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, a TSE, of deer, elk, moose, and now we've had a couple of cases in reindeer. And it's a unique disease because it's not a virus and it's not a bacteria, it's believed to be a prion which changes the protein, the cellular protein in an animal, and it continues to replicate an abnormal protein, and that's where we end up with this chronic wasting condition in these cervid species. So it's, it's unique, and yet it's in a family of diseases that we see, for example, the, what's commonly known as mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy is in the same family. We have a disease in scrape, called scrapie in sheep and goats that's in the same family. So it's in a family of diseases, but it seems to be unique to the cervid species. So is it really a disease or is it more like a genetic defect? Well, that's a great question. I think the, the science is still continuing to evolve. What exactly is a prion? What causes these proteins to become abnormal? Why do they fold and shape differently in these species than in others? And there's a lot of work actually to determine whether there might be some genetic predisposition in some of the cervid species. Is there a particular line that's more susceptible? This has been done in sheep, for example, and they found that to be the case. So the sheep industry has been breeding sheep that are more resistant to the scrapie organism, uh, and so they can limit that infectious process in their sheep populations. Mortality rate with, with CWD, I mean, if you get it, is it, is it a death sentence for them? It pretty well is, unfortunately, because there's no known cure, there's no available vaccine, and so once these animals contract the disease, it's a matter of time, unfortunately. It's a long incubation period. That's one of the challenges with the disease as well. So we could have a younger animal that may be affected, and we may not see it until it's older. 
And so that's why we established, based on the best research we had, we wouldn't take animals from states where they've had CWD in the last five years because it's a long incubation period, so that's where the five years came from. And so once they start presenting with clinical signs, actually seeing this wasting situation, listlessness, central nervous system signs, they'll fail pretty quickly. So when did CWD come about and how did we discover it? And actually, the discovery goes back to Colorado back in the 60s and a research facility out there, they had a disease and it was called chronic wasting disease and it wasn't for another decade or more, it was actually put in the family of TSEs. Wasn't quite sure what we had at that time, but that seems to be its origin and then unfortunately since then it's ended up in 26 states and Canadian provinces and so it's become a challenge for both the farmed and the wild servant populations across our country. So do they know how it started? Not specifically, not as I'm aware, but it, for some reason we ended up with this population in that uh, research facility in Colorado. Why that particular population, I don't know that anyone knows for sure, but it seems that was the first diagnosis of it, and I believe it wasn't until the early 80s when we actually had a diagnosis in a free-ranging animal. So it's been quite an evolution. It was. It, it, here in Indiana, of course, it was a disease considered to be in the West. We didn't think too much about it in the Midwest, and so it wasn't until the early 2000s that we had a diagnosis in Wisconsin, and suddenly it became uh, at the forefront for those of us here in the Midwest because, again, it was a disease that was considered to be in the western part of the United States, and from that time it's begun to move into a number of states across the country. Are they working on immunizations? There, there is some work ongoing. There's some hope that indeed maybe there'll be a vaccine in time. I just read a paper recently that there's a group working on this. And so there are a couple of different fronts that are being looked at. Of course, there's ongoing research on how it moves, how does it get from point A to point B, uh, the transmission modes. Vaccines are being looked at. So could we possibly come up with a vaccine of some type? So that research is ongoing. And also the genetic predisposition. Are some deer more susceptible than others? As I mentioned in the sheep population, we could look at genetic uh, populations and say these are more susceptible and these are, are less susceptible. And so they bred down that line. So there's discussions about doing that. Now, whether it's a genetic situation or if it's a vaccine situation, even yet in a wild population, it's very difficult to do. Trying to vaccinate wild populations, uh, even if a vaccine were available, can be challenging. But nonetheless, that research is ongoing. Now you'd mentioned mad cow disease. Is it mad cow disease? Well, it's in the same family. And so it's considered a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, a TSE, but it's a different and distinct disease in that family. So we don't believe that CWD crosses over into cattle, for example. We have no scientific evidence that that takes place. Similarly, we don't believe that scrapie in sheep transmits as a TSE into other species. And so in, those, in that family of diseases, they seem to be specific in their particular areas. And what does the disease actually do to the animal? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's the origin of its name, chronic wasting disease. So we ended up with deer and elk that were just wasting away. And so they were unthrifty, they were thin, uh, listless animals, and some of them would have behavioral changes because it affects the brain. And so they might have central nervous system signs, uh, and those were the unusual behaviors that people were early on seeing, and, and similarly today. A lot of these may die in the wild and are never diagnosed, but in our farm populations, that's what we've seen there as well, a similar presentation, either farmed or wild. Now you listed off that it affects deer, elk, now reindeer, does it affect any other species? So far as we know, that's where it is concentrated. Uh, reindeer were just recently added. We had a case in Illinois in 2018. There was a case in uh, the Scandinavian countries. And so now they're considered a susceptible species for the disease. Moose were not considered originally, and they were added some time ago because it, they were diagnosed as well. But it appears to be in the cervid species. Now, how far it may go into other cervid species? Of course, we have fallow deer and psycho deer and other deer out there as well, and so we continue to watch them. But nonetheless, it appears to be in those populations at this point. And of course, the huge question is, can it cross over into people? And that's been one of the continuing discussions that exists out there now. And what are the thoughts about it being transferred to people? And really, my thoughts are is probably people are thinking two different ways. One, the disease crossing from the animal to human, and two, actually consuming the animal. I mean, what are the thoughts 
and what are the findings right now? I appreciate right now because that science continues to evolve. We don't have any solid, strong scientific evidence that this chronic wasting disease, prion, is transmissible to humans. Uh, that being said, the CDC has a caution to say consume muscle meats, uh, not the brain, the spinal cord, lymph nodes, those kinds of tissues from a carcass, particularly from areas where the disease is known to, be, to exist. And of course that range can, is growing, so hunters need to be aware of where that disease has been diagnosed and therefore take those necessary precautions when they're field dressing a deer, wearing gloves, protect themselves, and then also, again, again preparing that carcass so it's muscle meats that can be uh, consumed, where we believe that uh, prion is, is certainly not as prevalent as, as it is in, say, the spinal cord and the brain. So I know in Indiana that there's no reported cases of CWD right now, right? That's correct. But I know that the disease is sprinkled all around Indiana right now. And um, in my opinion, eventually it will probably make it to Indiana. Do you guys have any forecast tools or any thoughts on when you might think it will come to our state? We're constantly evaluating what's out on the landscape. We partner with our Department of Natural Resources as they work with hunters and the wild populations. And then the Board of Animal Health is responsible for the farm service. And we have about 400 sites in Indiana that have farm service. They're required to test their deer. If there's any mortality on a farm site that's over 12 months of age, it's required to be tested. So there's ongoing testing. We'll have close to 1,000 samples a year off of our farmed operation. So that surveillance has been going on for some time. On the wild side, we collaborate with the Department of Natural Resources. Our first intensive surveillance statewide was in 2002. So we've been at this for a number of years watching for what might be going on in our populations. Again, have not diagnosed it in our wild populations, but we know it exists not far away from us in Illinois and in Michigan. And so we continue to collaborate with DNR for a plan. So what is the plan? The first plan was produced in 2003 and it's had iterations over the years. And we're close to a, another draft, another iteration of that, and it's being finalized now. But the notion is that we will continue to work together to figure out how to address it uh, if and when it's diagnosed in Indiana. So whether it's on the farm side or on the free ranging side, so how best to approach that task. And that's the part of that plan that we've been working on for several years. So there's been a lot of work in surveillance, both on the farm and the wild side over the years in Indiana. And how many farms does Indiana have? I'd have to take a look at the figures. The last figure I recall is about 7,500. And what about the population of deer in Indiana, like the wild? I don't have that figure. I don't know that that's available. What are the percentage of your testing is uh, the farm versus the wild. And without knowing exactly how large the wild population is, uh, one of the things I know DNR is working on now as they plan for this fall and in the out years is how to target surveillance because there's white-tailed deer in every county. And so how best to accomplish that task, and that's what they're working on now. So whether it's a focus on deer that show clinical signs and that are deer that look unusual and are reported in, uh, as opposed to, and in addition to the kind of surveillance that we've done, that anything that dies on a farm has to be submitted. So they're working through that planning now, exactly to your point, what's, what's enough, and what is the best use of their resources to find the disease out in the population. Have you found that CWD is more prevalent in the farm situation versus the wild? There's a lot of questions back and forth on how it moves. Uh, deer movement, animal movement is always, well, in any kind of disease, is always one thing that has to be considered. You also have movements of populations in there. You know, I'm not a deer biologist by any means, but just the, the movements of deer onto the, on the landscape and the elk populations. So there's a lot of discussion about how it actually moves. We also take a look at how the disease is transmitted. We believe it's feces, urine, saliva, which could potentially contaminate the environment for a time and maybe for a long time. So there are ways that we're continuing to do research to figure out exactly how this particular, particular prion moves around on the landscape and even amongst the populations. What is like the plan if CWD does come here? Well, it's a great, great question and the plan and this, I'm not evading your question, but it depends. Yeah. It depends, is it found in a farmed animal, a farm servant, because it, that's in an enclosure, and we have a process from the Board of Animal Health that we would work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture to depopulate that population of infected animals. 
Uh, is it in an area where there are a lot of deer, farm deer known to exist? Uh, are there a lot of farms out there that have these? We do the trace in and trace outs. So what did you sell and where did it go? Where did you purchase? Did you buy the disease? Those sorts of things on the farm side. If it's found on the wild side, then again, so where is it in the state? Is it an area where we've been looking? Or is it a surprise? Uh, what's the density of deer in that area? What's the topography of that area? Is it open bean fields or is it forest? You know, all sorts of things would dictate how, what kind of approach might be taken. One of the advantages, I suppose you could say, is that at least at this point, Indiana has an opportunity to look at examples that other states have done. Wisconsin, for example, they tried to eliminate the deer populations in some areas of the state, and that's very difficult to do, depending upon the topography, et cetera. It can be very resource intensive, it can be over a long period of time, and so that was their approach. Um, Illinois, as I understand, has said, well, if we find a positive CWD deer on the landscape, then we'll intensify our surveillance in that area, attempt to reduce the population in that area. And so it's just a different approach and how intensive that effort might be. So I think our DNR is, uh, has an opportunity to kind of evaluate what works well, depending upon where it's diagnosed, how dense those deer are, what the topography looks like, what resources might be available. It could be very expensive to go about a process of controlling or eradicating CWD on the landscape. So I'm not trying to evade your question, but the plan tries to attempt to capture all those variables. And so really until it happens, it's difficult to say exactly how it'll roll out. Now I know that there are hunters that put out uh, mineral blocks and salt blocks on off season. Is there any research at all that shows that these um, items are help transferring the disease among the deer? I haven't seen anything that would suggest that that's the case. On the other hand, one of the reasons that there's concern about bringing congregations of deer together is regardless of what the disease is, it presents an opportunity for transmission. So I know that again, DNR looks at that as part of their planning. One of the things that we've done on the farm side is that we wouldn't permit the import of a cervid animal from a state that's had CWD in the last five years whether it's in the farmed or on the wild side. So if you've had CWD in your state or Canadian province, for example, in the last five years, we haven't taken them. And that's been in place for over 15 years. So I think that's also contributed to our ability at this point to say that we don't have the disease now. It may be here now, it may have come in, but at least to this point, we've had those procedures in place. It's probably been 15 years or so where we restricted the movement of materials into the state. So if you shot a deer or elk in another state, you could only bring back particular materials, uh, debone meats and those sorts of things. So we tried to put those procedures in over the years in hopes of protecting our populations as long as possible. So what state has been hit the bet most? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd have to look at the map because it depends upon whether it's white-tailed deer or elk. Uh, some have been hit hard in the west, so you have Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, and the western parts of Nebraska and Kansas in particular. Then when it came to the Midwest, we ended up with Wisconsin. There have been cases diagnosed, frankly, all around us, with the exception of Kentucky and Indiana. We're kind of an island here right now. But I think our prohibition on imports has helped us over the years to at least limit the amount of exposure that we've had over the years. So as a hunter, what should I be concerned about going out this season or in the future? I think hunters just in one need to be aware of what's going on in the world around them about CWD, where it's been diagnosed, what's going on with it, what's the latest information about it as you're providing here. So I think that's important that they just be aware of what's going on. Secondly, then taking precautions when they're field dressing. You know, cover your hands, wash, those kinds of things. Be aware of what utensils you're using, those kinds of precautions, and there's additional information about that. But I think, uh, at least at this point, there's also an opportunity for that deer to be tested if a hunter wants to do that, and that would be, they'll have to collaborate with the Department of Natural Resources on that if they want to go that particular route. But I think there are a number of things hunters can do. If nothing else, just be aware what's what's going on. We have a number of people in Indiana that go west, and they hunt in areas where CWD is known to exist. And so just being aware of where that disease exists, what additional precautions they might choose to take. And again, if they choose to test their carcass, CDC suggests to say if it tests positive, then they suggest a hunter not eat it. Now I've heard a rumor that if you harvest a deer and you take it to a professional butcher to get it processed, that that butcher is gonna be required to test it before he can actually process the deer. Is that correct? 
Well, again, that would be through DNR. I don't have anything specific okay. from the Board of Animal Health, so that may be part of the planning that they're discussing. Okay. And we're here in June, and so between now and the start of that season, through the Hunter's Guide and other materials, there'll be more coming. And then I'm, I'm also assuming in that Hunter's Guide will also be able to direct them where they would go to get it tested. Where they go to get additional information, whether it's a website, and then from that website, for example, if you see an abnormal looking deer, and I think that's one of the things for hunters, not to shoot a deer that looks unfit to eat, for example. And so uh, being aware of those kinds of things as well. And then there'll be more materials coming over the next few months so that hunters know where to go with information if they see a deer that's unusual or they'd like to have materials tested, those kinds of things that'll be coming in the coming months. Okay, so once again, assuming that if DNR does not put out that uh, restriction that they have to have it uh, tested, if they want to just have it tested on their own, that information will be in there as well. That'll be similar information on how to get it tested if someone chooses to have it tested. Now, do you know anything that prevents CWD? I'm not aware of any treatment or uh, feeds or additives, or I, I'm not aware of anything that, that prevents the disease or treats it because there's no known treatment for the disease that I'm aware of. It also seems that CWD has shown up more in the news, social media, uh, the interwebs, and I just was wondering uh, if you had any thoughts why it is showing up more. And we've seen some of those popular press items as well. I think it's unfortunate it's been called zombie disease and things like that, but you know, it's CWD. It's the same CWD that's been around for 50 or more years in various parts of our country. We just need to be aware that it could be on the move. Uh, we've had states that have been diagnosed with CWD in the last few months. I think that's generated some additional interest, whether it's uh, Mississippi or Tennessee. There were new states, so to speak, so that generates new interest because it's moved into new areas, or at least it's been diagnosed in new areas. So. It'll continue to evolve. Uh, I suspect we'll have cases that are diagnosed where we didn't expect it in, in other areas of our country. And that's why I, I appreciate what you're doing, just to keep people advised on where that disease exists and, and just being aware as you go, to, go out to hunt. Thanks again, Dr. Marsh, for meeting with us. I really appreciate you taking the time to answer the questions. If you wanna learn more about chronic wasting disease, make sure you contact the Indiana Board of Animal Health. The information will be on the screen or down in the description. Or, if you prefer, leave a comment and I'll contact them for you. I'm the OCD Hunter and I hope that my continual painstaking practice of changing, fixing, and improving on ideas will help you out in your endeavors. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Click the bell next to the subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Comments are always welcome.